Hello and welcome to another edition of Matters of the Heart, brought to you from Pentucket Medical Cardiology and Haverhill Community Television. I'm Dr. Seth Bilizarian, a cardiologist with Pentucket Medical, and I'm joined again this week by Dr. Sunny Srivastava, my associate from Pentucket Medical Cardiology in Haverhill. Today we're going to talk about diabetes, diabetes, uh, a medical problem people are well, well know about, but primarily about its effect on heart and heart and vascular disease. Dr. Srivastava, tell me a little bit about what a person, a patient, should think about diabetes. Sure. Um, I guess to start, it would make sense to explain a little bit about what diabetes is. And to do so, I have prepared a graphic that might help in, in doing that. Great. Let's look at that. That uh, could help. And essentially, diabetes comes down to being a disorder revolving around a hormone called insulin. And there can be two problems. One, the body might not make enough insulin. And insulin is important in metabolizing sugar or glucose in the body. Or two, and, and perhaps more commonly, the body becomes resistant to insulin. You have the insulin, but your body becomes resistant to it. And that's what's commonly known as type 2 diabetes. And um, what we've learned, and what I think is most very important for, for patients in, in, to know, is that diabetes is much more than just a sugar problem. It ends up having profound effects on the cardiovascular system, and we'll talk about more today, obviously. Um, to talk more about diabetes, uh, I think it's important to talk about who gets it and how common it is and how prevalent it is. So I prepared a few graphics regarding that as well. It is a, um, a disorder that I think is largely becoming an epidemic, really, when you have close to 20, 22 million Americans with the disorder. Um, and like I said before, the majority have what we call type 2 diabetes. Um, and we've always thought of type 2 diabetes as being something that comes on in adulthood or later in your years. Uh, but what's sad or, or, or is that it is becoming more prevalent in the youth. In fact, 1 to 2 percent of those in their 20s uh, are starting to, to develop diabetes. And interestingly, um, millions upon millions of Americans are largely undiagnosed. And so I think programs like this are really important in just trying to raise awareness uh, regarding the matter. Um, what else can I say about the demographics? I can say, you know, it is increasing tremendously. There's another graphic I prepared. Um, well, before we switch oh, graphics, just sure. looking at these numbers, maybe you could help me understand what your thoughts are. What's the public health thinking about what's going into it? You mentioned this huge increase in diabetes, sure. and you mentioned it's happening in kids. Like, what's the story there? Why right. are kids sure. getting Sure, and I think uh, a large, uh, without a doubt, obesity is playing a major, major role. Obesity and a sedentary lifestyle, uh -huh. poor diet, they're all linked together, obviously. Okay. Um, but as the body becomes obese, its cells, the, the cells in the body are no longer, um, they become resistant to insulin. And that's the, the crux of the problem. And so obesity, sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, all these things really feed into the problem. Okay. And um, that in and of itself, obesity is becoming an epidemic okay. as well. Um, so, so that's primarily the thing that's causing it, especially in, those, in the kids. So it's, a, it's the overweight kids who are not leading a healthier lifestyle, both with diet and exercise. Absolutely. That's really the main thing. So if someone's worried about this, that's an area to begin to think about strategies. To Absolutely. Help and I think we... You can't start too early with regards to this. Um, I think you, you know, we see it every day. Um, society in general, but children are becoming more obese, more sedentary, and I think it's a, it's a real cause for alarm, okay. no doubt about it. Okay. So you mentioned so someone should think about this. So tell me what, when someone thinks about it, what would they do to think about it? Like what are some strategies to think about it? You mentioned that some people don't know they have it. They may not have been diagnosed, but, but other than thinking about it, what can someone do? Um, well, well, certainly maintaining routine doctor visits, I think, is key and paramount to all this because quite often people don't feel anything or are asymptomatic. Okay. And then the next question is, what are the symptoms? Okay. Uh, and, and it can be very subtle symptoms and, and they, you know, fatigue, not feeling right, right. Uh, frequent urination. Um, but I think the, the real important thing is frequent visits with your doctor, regular visits with your doctor, blood work is really the way to get at this, to, to diagnose it. And uh, most doctors will perform screening blood work uh, during a routine physical exam. And fasting blood work is the real, I think, best way to get at this. And there are numbers that you have as cutoffs for fitting the diagnosis of diabetes or not. Okay. Uh, a fasting blood sugar level greater than 126 is, gives you a diagnosis of diabetes. But what we've also learned is that Fasting blood sugars below that, but still a little elevated in the hundreds, for example, uh, high hundreds, falls into another category that we call, um, you can call pre-diabetes or impaired fasting glucose. 
And that's almost you can think of in a way as a warning sign, I suppose, as it's time to get your act together. You know, you're, you're, you're squeaking, you're getting closer to diabetes, and so it's time to get the exercise going, the diets, and be really aware of, of the, the condition. Okay. Well, one thing that you mentioned, you mentioned the frequent urination or, or the mm -hmm. thirst that some people have. And I've had some patients say to me that I can't have diabetes because I don't have the, that, those mm -hmm. problems. Maybe you could address, like, what does that mean? Do, do I have to wait for that to have the diagnosis? No, diabetes? absolutely not. And so I'd say more often than not, folks are asymptomatic. And um, those symptoms are often present at a much more advanced stage. And so I would not really rely on just having those symptoms alone okay. to make a diagnosis okay. by any means. Okay. Very good. So let's, let's talk about the, the trends that you mentioned. You have a graphic here about uh, the trends of diabetes in America. Yeah, so there's a few trends. I mean, certainly there's a, there's a slide of, or a graphic I prepared showing the starker or marked increase in the prevalence of diabetes. Um, dating back to the 1960s or so, it, it wasn't really thought of a major healthcare issue or a major problem. Its prevalence was not significant. You fast forward, and it's very clear on this graphic alone, you can see the, the, the dramatic increase. You fast forward to 2004, where there's 20 plus million people with it, and it is escalating more, or projected to escalate even more going forward based on the fact of the, you know, the prevalence of obesity and poor diet, et cetera. And it's not only a problem in America, uh, it's also a, uh, uh, a worldwide problem. Um, actually, before I even get to that, I prepared another graphic I can show about just where it is in the country. There's a, a graphic with the map of our country. Sure, let's look at that map, show of, that a map of the U.S. That's a fascinating map. That, uh, so this is, we're in election time. That's right, yeah, is this, this looks like red, a CNN. Are these red and blue states? Are these Democrats and Republicans? Well, or unfortunately, what red and blue is not so good on this. Okay. Um, if you look back in 1991, um, the yellow was the majority color there, and that prevalence was 4 to 6% of the adult population in those states with yellow had diabetes. So let me just make sure I understand. So in 1991, on the left map, almost the whole country is yellow. Our state of Massachusetts is yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a 5% about yep. incidence of diabetes. So one out of 20 people in the U.S. in all those yellow states had diabetes. 19 out of 20 did not have diabetes. Right. And that's still not insignificant. That's a, a fairly high number to begin with, okay. one in 20. But you fast forward 10 years to 2001, the, the, the graphic on the right and it's a stark change, a dramatic change. And now you have new colors popping up on the map that you didn't have beforehand, with, which represents higher levels of incidence. And you can really see in the southeast of our country, uh, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi, those are the highest prevalence, uh, those are the states with the highest prevalence of diabetes. Uh, Alabama was the highest in the country at about 12%, I believe, of the population, uh, adult population with diabetes. And there's a few yellow states left still. Minnesota did the best with the lowest percentage uh, of approximately 5% of the adult population with diabetes. And the purpose of this is just to reinforce the, the, the message that it is, I think, becoming an epidemic. It is, it's a lot of people with diabetes. And, um, so epidemic, just another way to say just a really big health problem, public health problem. Big public health problem, and it has a huge ripple effects, so to speak, because it is more than just a blood sugar problem. And um, you know, obviously, we're both cardiologists, and we focus on matters of the heart. And diabetes really does affect the heart. It affects a lot of things. And I have a graphic prepared that depicts the different effects diabetes has on the body. So yes, it affects your blood sugar levels. But the elevated blood sugar levels can really affect a lot of different things. Uh, one, it can affect the large blood vessels of your body and cause plaque and disease in those. And as a result, people with diabetes have a higher risk of what we call cardiovascular events or heart attacks or stroke or heart failure. And that increase is two to four times increased. They also have a higher risk of other conditions such as kidney disease. Um, also, they can have effects on the small blood vessels that go to their eyes or their legs and they can get develop blindness, they can develop problems with circulation in their legs. Um, what else am I missing here? They um, can develop something called neuropathy, where the legs can be painful and numb, and, uh, and that's a, a major problem as well. So one time, sometimes I'm sure you, patients have asked you, you know, that this is, might shorten my life, and people sometimes say, well, I don't mind if I live less long. Some mm -hmm. people say that. But I think that the message that you're giving is it's not just 
an impact on our longevity or the quantity of life, but in fact the quality of life. So you know the impact of a, living a life after a stroke or oh, living yeah. life with blindness, mm -hmm. living life with amputations is something that you know we don't give up on people, but if we can prevent those things, it just dramatically improves quality of life. Right. Absolutely. It, um, it does, as you said, it does reduce one's life expectancy, certainly. And I don't want to make this sound like a doom and gloom affair here because the, the point is that we can do a lot of things to uh, reduce the risk of bad things happening, certainly. And I think awareness is the first step in that. And that's, you know, the, the, this is a great opportunity to talk about that. Sure. Um, so to move on a little bit more to focus in on the heart uh, a little bit and diabetes effect on the heart that, um, like I said before, many people really focus in on the fact that they have a blood sugar problem. And almost three-quarters of people with diabetes don't even realize that they're at higher risk for what we call, refer to as cardiovascular events or heart disease. People, and that's a, that's a staggering amount of people who don't realize it. Um, and there's a graphic I have that talks about what people with diabetes ultimately pass away from. And it's a useful graphic to show because it's quite striking to see that a vast majority of people with diabetes ultimately do not pass away as a result of high blood sugar. It's um, a result of cardi the, cardiac disease. The consequences disease. of the sugar on the blood vessels. Right, primary. right. So it is blood sugar, but it's the trickle-down effect right. of the blood sugar. So this graphic is, I think, a, a very useful one to see. Just to orient the viewers slightly to this, that uh, on the bottom are various causes of, of ultimately dying in people with diabetes. And on the left are the a percent number of deaths. And as you can see, on the left, the, the most common one, it says ischemic heart disease. What that means essentially is coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis or heart, heart attacks. attacks right, heart attacks or blockages in the arteries of the heart. And that by far is the most common cause. The next one is a little more vague in general, other heart disease. That can be complications from heart attacks, such as congestive heart failure, certainly. Um, and if you go further down, stroke is on that list as well, and we consider that a cardiovascular problem. It's a vascular problem because you can develop blockages in the arteries that go to your brain. Um, and so it's really imperative that folks with diabetes are aware of this heightened risk of, of, of heart events or heart disease. Okay. So I think we've hopefully started to give the message that this is something that we need to think seriously in a large scale as a nation about moving more and watching our diet, mm -hmm. preventative strategies. We need to think about strategies to start recognizing it in individuals. People should start asking questions, do I have diabetes? Mm -hmm. Can I be checked? Visit their physician and be very sort of proactive. There are even free clinics available where people can get their blood sugars checked. So those are strategies. Uh, but once someone has diabetes, I guess we're starting to talk now about what someone should do. And it's a very serious thing, but there are some strategies. So right. let's, let's start beginning so, to talk about that. So, so certainly when one is diagnosed with diabetes, I mean, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of things that go into play. One sure. is treatment, and I don't want to get into talking about a lot of specific medications about diabetes, but treatment of the elevated blood sugar uh -huh. is, is important. But as we talked about or have been talking about, there are a lot of other things involved with diabetes. So we get um, very aggressive with treating things such as cholesterol, blood pressure. Um, we want to make sure that people get their eyes checked because, as we talked about before, um, diabetes can affect the small blood vessels that go to the eyes. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure people have their feet examined because um, with the neuropathy and the blood circulation problems that can develop from the high blood sugar levels, that's important to have that checked. We often want to have the kidneys checked because the kidneys can be affected and damaged by diabetes. Okay. And, and something people don't talk about a lot, we look for um, the kidneys help filter a lot of different things out. And sometimes people can spill out protein into their urine through the kidneys. So that's something that's very important to measure as well. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to be followed very carefully when someone has a diagnosis of diabetes. But I think something you said earlier, I, I'd love to just go back to talk about it briefly, is you, you mentioned that once someone crosses over the line of a blood sugar of 126 on that morning blood sugar, so they go to bed, after supper they don't eat, they have a 12-hour flash, they come in the morning and they get their blood sugar checked, and they have a blood sugar that's over 126, we really would say that they're diabetic. And Absolutely. if they lose weight and they exercise, their blood sugar may get better, 
but they're actually always considered diabetic because right. we're worried about their risk of all of these things that can happen. So we try to be very good. So it's not because we want to call them names, but we would say that right. they are diabetics. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, then that's a really important thing because not because we want to call them names, but because once someone is labeled Doctors have become more intense mm -hmm. in thinking about these things you just described. The eyes, the kidneys, the cholesterol, the feet become a really critical thing for prevention of, right. of developing right. problems. And I think there's another graphic that I think might be interesting to, to center this discussion on, looking at, uh, it's a, 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 from a study that, uh, that looked at diabetes and, and its um, relationship to coronary disease. Uh -huh. And so it's a study. It, it takes a little explaining in the graphic because it's um, sure. a bit sciencey in nature. Um, so it's coming up here. Just a few more clicks on it there. So what this this is a, a landmark research study that was published in a very prominent medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was a population-based study in Finland, of all places. And they looked at patients with diabetes and patients without diabetes and track them over, I think, seven to eight years to see what their incidence of heart attacks were. So on the left, you see exactly that, the incidence of heart attack. MI stands for myocardial infarction, which means heart attack. And on the bottom, there are folks who had never had a heart attack before. Those, the category says no prior MI. And then there are folks who've had a heart attack before. On the right, that says prior MI. Um, so those are people who have a history of coronary artery disease whereas the folks on the left, no history of coronary artery disease. And within that, there are diabetics and non-diabetics. And you can see the non-diabetics, who've never had a history of heart problems or anything, they have the lowest future incidence of heart attacks. Now, once someone has diabetes, the next bar, that red bar, which is labeled 20.2, but they still have had no history of heart problems beforehand, their incidence of heart attack jumps up tremendously. And in fact, that incidence of heart attack is equal, essentially, if you look over to the next bar on the right, the, le the yellow bar, of people who've had heart attacks before. So what, what essentially that point, it's a, lo it's a lot of talk, but what a mum Well, let me make sure I understand. Yeah. So let me say it the way I think you said it, is that, so if, I, if I'm a person who's never had a heart attack but has diabetes, based on this study over the next seven years, I might expect a chance of having a heart attack of one out of five. That's 20%. Sure. But if I had a heart attack and I don't have diabetes, my chance of having another heart attack over the next seven years is about the same, one in five. Right. Is that a way to think about so it? So yeah, so essentially what, what we in the profession have boiled this down to is that diabetes, as far as risk goes, becomes equivalent or equal to as if you had heart disease already to begin with. And that really forms the backbone of our aggressive strategy in treating patients in a preventative way with aggressive cholesterol goals and lowering cholesterol, aggressive blood pressure goals, because we know treating those two things really go a long way to reduce your risk for future heart attacks. Right. So if you have heart disease, let's just finish the graphic and go yeah. back to the graphic that you had, which I thought was excellent. Um, if you have had heart disease and diabetes, what's your chance of having a heart attack over the next seven years? And that's almost a one out of two chance. It's high, right, right, exactly. That's the bar all the way to the right that is getting close, just as you said, close to 50%, and that's, that's pretty darn high. Right. Um, and so, it really underscores the need, I think, with exclamation points of, of how important it is to um, routine fo routinely follow up with your doctors, get aggressive about cholesterol, blood pressure, lifestyle changes. Right. Um, I don't think the importance can be underscored enough. Yes. You know, we often say, I think, um, that we both say to our patients that if you've had a heart problem, heart attack, an angioplasty bypass surgery, it's very reasonable to check in with your cardi cardiologist at least annually to Absolutely. get all of these things checked over. We're part of the team. We're not the only member of the team. Of course, an internal medicine specialist, family medicine doctors, others are, are critical parts of the team. But we really think it's important to see a cardiologist for these reasons, because you can see that the, the chance that you're going to have another heart attack is substantial, and having all of the things properly organized, the state-of-the-art medications, the, st the numbers reviewed, is really a, an important thing. And I think what we're learning, too, is that uh, diabetes is really becoming a multidisciplinary approach, a team approach, just as you said, that there are a lot of different providers involved. There are often um, diabetic teachers or nutritionists who get involved, which is very important. Uh, there are often kidney doctors involved, podiatrists, eye doctors, internists, cardiologists. So it really is a multidisciplinary team approach 
um, that I think the patients benefit the most from uh, visiting all these different entities. Okay. So um, one of the things so you also said that I think will be really bears mentioning, I would say as a cardiologist, I would really want to emphasize is that we think about diabetes primarily as a blood sugar problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of emphasis on doing a good job trying to get the blood sugar under control, helping the body that's failing to keep blood sugar control by itself by using certain diabetes medicines to control it. Mm -hmm. But I think that you mentioned something that's very important that really bears emphasis because I think a lot of people don't know this. But actually, the better way to prevent heart attacks and stroke I'm not suggesting you shouldn't control your sugar, right. but is to actually get your, the number one thing that we know you can do as a diabetic is to get your LDL or bad cholesterol low. Right. And the current goal is to have it less than 100 for the LDL right. or bad cholesterol. And that's with a class of medicines called statins, right. which we won't say much about, but a cholesterol treatment. The number two most important thing is to get your blood pressure controlled, yeah, and that's less than 130. And both of those two things do much more than sugar control for preventing strokes and heart attacks. Yeah. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that people not do a good job with their sugar because sure. the sugar seems to have important impact on our eyes and our kidneys in that neuropathy problem you described. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it's a it's a it's a team thing. But some people, I've heard people say to me, patients, you know, my sugar is good. I don't need to worry about my cholesterol. And that's completely incorrect. Yeah, and I think that's our job, is where we, our job comes in, is to educate and to really drive that. I think you said it perfectly, that whole that message. Um, and just to expand on that a little bit, just to clarify what these different cholesterol numbers are, I hear a lot of people talking about their total cholesterol. They say, well, it's 200. I'm okay. But there's more to it than just that. And you start to mention the LDL. That's what we call the bad cholesterol. You can think of L for you want it lower. Then there's the HDL, and that's your good cholesterol, H for higher. And uh, then there's another type of particle called triglycerides as well, and that can often be elevated in patients with diabetes. Um, and the mainstay of treatment, as you mentioned, uh, is the medic cholesterol medications called statins that really do a very good job of driving down the bad cholesterol with, truthfully, I'd say fairly minimal risk or side effects. I think it's a very safe medication. Um, and, uh, and so there's more to it. I guess my, my take home point is that there's more to it than just the total number of 200 that everyone always talks about. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that uh, we like to get that LDL, that bad cholesterol, as you said, to less than 100. It's the same goal that we have for patients who've had heart attacks before without diabetes. So we always talk about being aggressive with patients who've had heart attacks. And it shows, you know, it's the same goals for people with diabetes. It shows you how serious the, the condition is. Yeah. Um, well, let's together review for, for, the, for the audience some numbers because some people are interested in this and others may not. Sure. But let's briefly talk about numbers. So the blood pressure number that I think we would talk about for all patients, diabetics or not, but because diabetics are so much higher risk, we want to be especially strict, would be less than 130. Right. The top, it, the top number. Right, the yeah. top number. And, and, and patients ask that question, exact yeah. question. Yeah. Do I worry about the bottom number? Yes, as your cardiologist, we'll talk about that. We'll think about that. But one, we'll let you just worry about the top number. Yeah. And the top number would be 130. There are some conditions, people who have kidney problems, we actually want a little bit lower than that. But right. we'll say 130 is a good number for people to remember. And tell us what numbers that you think we should talk Is there any sugar numbers that we would talk about, long-term sugar? Sure. I mean, there numbers? are, right, so there are ways of... Um, you just said it, so checking your long-term sugar control, something called the hemoglobin A1C. And it's a really, it's like a, a measure of how good your sugar control has been over the last few months. And the lower the better, certainly. Um, you know, I, I often think of getting it less than 6.5 as a very good desirable goal. Okay. Um, and, I, you know, we often see people who have it out of control in the, in the tens. And um, I, I think it's a really good way of sitting down with the patient and explaining to them that the blood sugar has not been... In, in control. Okay. Um, so blood pressure 130, that yeah. hemoglobin A1C number less than 6.5, and then we mentioned the cholesterol number of the LDL less than 100. So yeah. some really basic numbers, and there's a bunch of the different heart societies and diabetic societies that have these emphasis that to know your numbers. Patients should right. know their numbers, and of course you need to know your numbers, you need to know what the numbers mean, and those are some basic numbers to and know. And you have to get them checked. And you have to, <laughs> you get have them to go checked. see right. You have to go get, them just get them checked. Exactly. So it's a, there's some really great strategies, and we've come a really long way. And I think hopefully we've emphasized for patients that that diabetes is a very serious problem. I don't yeah. think we can get any get around. We can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. 
but that with really good treatment, with good cooperation through both medications and some lifestyle changes. Yeah. And these lifestyle changes we're talking about, we're not talking about having to run the marathon. No, absolutely We're not. talking about, you know, working, working regularly in terms of regular walking. Um, 150 minutes per week has been said to be the minimum amount of walking, yeah. so that's 50 minutes three times a week or 30 minutes five times a week. Try to cut back on some intake. And actually, to that end, too, I would like to say I have... A, N numerous times per day people will say to me, well, I'm busy at work. I walk around at work. Mm -hmm. And I just really want to, I, I really tell people that's not good enough. Uh -huh. um, that's, that's what I call routine daily activities of living. You know, that's not frank exercise. Right. Um, so for, I really think people really need to make an effort to go that next step for exercise. And I, I often tell people, you know, you should be sweating and huffing and puffing and, uh -huh. you know, not be able to sit there and read the newspaper while you're exercising or, or, or have a full conversation with somebody for it to really be a you know, there's different people can do different things, obviously, right. based on their other medical condition. Right. But in general, just your average walking around the office or, you know, walking around a large school where you teach at or something, sure. I don't consider that good enough exercise okay. necessarily. Well, I mean, it speaks to a, another point that you make, mm -hmm. I think, is, you know, we have talked earlier about the children and the importance, you know, for, the, for, the, for our patients who have children at home, making this a family affair can really be a very helpful thing. I mean, yeah. if we're talking about walking a minimum of three times a week, there are two weekend days, so that's two. <laughs> we have to find one weekday to try to get together as a family and walk after dinner or, or do something. Or that, ride bikes or something. Ride bicycles, um, play soccer, whatever it is that people need to do. So I, I, I think that's great that hopefully we've emphasized the team approach of patient cooperation with the physician and the physician cooperation, but we have some really powerful, wonderful ways um, my family's recently had some deaths, and uh, the deaths have fortunately have been in the people in their late 80s, and uh, people were remarking at the funerals that uh, we, we now are seeing people live well into their late 80s, and I think that that is largely through the great therapies that we have. We really are recognizing things earlier. We're giving people mm -hmm. good therapies. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit fearful that we're going to start slipping back because people are starting to not do things on their own, like the diet and exercise part. So. I, I think that this has been really a great review of diabetes, the mm -hmm. importance of recognizing it. And I'd like to just finish by saying thank you, Dr. Srivastava, for, for bringing this to our attention and for, uh, again, summarizing the critical importance of recognizing diabetes, treating it aggressively, treating it equivalent to heart disease, and uh, cooperating with your physician and being aggressive to prevent long-term problems. Thanks for joining me.